As we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study of 2 Peter called The Danger of Forgetting to Remember, we want to study one more time about the need to remember the severe carnality you can experience as a believer. So let me invite you to go, first of all, to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Though the Bible is filled with many positive and encouraging promises from God that are great and precious, it is also replete with many negative warnings and even examples of the consequences of sin and false teaching. And through the word of God, God has spoken and he has not stuttered in revealing his truth to us. And keep in mind that God has given us his word not to scintillate our intellect or to satisfy our curiosity, but to transform our destinies and then our lives by knowing the truth, believing the truth, getting established in the truth, and then remembering the truth that we know. And thus far in our study of 2 Peter chapter 1, we've observed four key truths God wants you to remember and know. Number one, we've noticed that God wants you to remember the Savior You've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, God wants you to remember your spiritual blessings by his grace as he's given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. Thirdly, God wants you to remember the spiritual growth you can enjoy as he wants us to diligently walk by faith and allow him to build into our life moral qualities that reflect the Lord Jesus Christ and spiritual fruitfulness, including good works. And then fourthly, he wants us to remember the severe carnality you can experience. And regarding this warning about severe carnality and its potential consequences in our life, Peter states in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 9, For he who lacks these things, these moral quality and fruitful works, is short-sighted, <coughs> even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. And keep in mind, this does not describe an unbeliever, but a believer. Because only a believer has been cleansed from his sins. And that a believer can become short-sighted, near-sighted. The Greek word literally is the word in which we get myopia. And not only short-sighted, even to blindness, totally lose his eternal perspective, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. So dear fellow believers, what does a, a, a consistently carnal believer forget? They forget the forgiveness. The forgiveness that is theirs in Christ. And the objective of that is not only to go to heaven, but it's to become holy for God is holy. It's to live, to live a life that honors Him. It's to live a life out of gratitude for His grace and all that He's blessed us with. It's to live a life of purpose and meaning, of redeeming the time for the days are evil and the days are short. And so, believer, don't squander your resources in Christ by walking after the flesh instead of walking by the Spirit. Don't waste your opportunities to spiritually grow and to serve the Lord. Don't lose your eternal perspective and spiritual eyesight by living for yourself according to human viewpoint, instead of living for Jesus Christ in light of the Word of God. You see, the purpose of justification is to result in sanctification on our way to glorification. Otherwise, God would take you home immediately upon trusting Christ as your Savior. And to illustrate the reality of the severe carnality of believer who fails to grow spiritually can experience, we've been observing the life of an Old Testament believer by the name of Samson, a he-man with a she-weakness. First, we noted Samson's potential, how he had a great purpose for living. He was a, a Nazarite from his mother's womb and separated for God's service. God's plan was to use him to begin to deliver Israel from the bondage of the Philistines who had had them in captivity for some 40 years. 
And in the same way, you as a believer have a great purpose. To glorify God and to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. With a home in heaven, but representing your Savior here on earth. As you shine as lights in, a, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, holding forth the word of life. Samson had a great purpose for living. Secondly, we noted that he had a godly set of parents. They were not perfect parents, but they were spiritually responsive parents who were praying parents. And they were a minority in those days of apostasy in Israel. Parents, are you training up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? Thirdly, he had a personal relationship with the Lord. Samson was a believer. He was a man of faith, though he was not a faithful man. By the way, is that true of you? See, there's no potential for spiritual success until you, first of all, are born again, until you become a child of God by God's grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, apart from law, works, and ritual. Samson was saved. He was justified before God. And not only that, but fourthly, he had the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. And while the Holy Spirit regenerated every Old Testament believer in the Lord, imputing to them, or imparting to them, I should say, a new nature and spiritual life, when they were justified by faith alone, the Holy Spirit would only selectively come upon certain believers for a period of time under the law to enable them to do the will of God, usually in a very special way. And this is very different than in our present dispensation of grace, when all believers are indwelt and sealed and baptized by the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation, so they then can be taught and enabled by the Holy Spirit to fulfill the will of God. But with all this spiritual potential, Samson had some serious problems. And we saw in our last study five of his problems, which we all need to hear and heed lest we experience the tragic consequences of sin in our lives. For he who lacks these things, remember, is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. The first of Samson's problem that we noticed, he had the wrong kind of separation. Samson was a Nazarite externally, but he was not separated to the Lord internally. He was a Nazarite by habit, but he was not a Nazarite by heart. He was a man of faith, but he was not a faithful man. He had the Holy Spirit, but he walked normally after the flesh. He had a position of separation to God as a Nazarite, but he failed to have a personal separation as unto the Lord in his, Christian, or in, his, in his personal walk. And this is like so many <coughs> believers today. For you as a believer have three spiritual enemies. You have the flesh inside of you, you have the world system outside of you, and you have Satan who is the God of that world system, and all three of these work in collusion in order to seek to defeat you as a believer and hinder your walk and hinder your growth and hinder your fruitfulness and hinder your service to the Lord. And though you have legally and positionally died in Christ to all of these enemies, these can defeat you and defeat many a believer because of a failure to avail themselves to the victory that is ours in Christ. And that is why it is so important to know your identity in Christ and live on the resurrection side of the cross, as it were. You see, the fact is we were all part of Satan's world kingdom before we were saved. We walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, Ephesians 2, verse 2. But then we heard the gospel and how Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose again. And through faith alone in him, salvation becomes ours. 
And as a result, at that moment, the Spirit of God not only saved us from the penalty of sin, which is hell, but placed us into union with Christ so that we were crucified with him, we were buried with him, and we've been raised with him. We are a new creation in Christ. We thus have died to the world system and its prince of the power of the air, namely Satan. We have died to our sin natures. And we are now alive unto God. And though we still have a sin nature that wants to run our life just like there's still the world and Satan, we no longer have to yield to those authorities, our past authorities in our life. This first part of the gospel is oftentimes the gospel for the unsaved. These other truths are oftentimes called the gospel for the saved. And thus, God's appeal to you now as a believer is found in Romans chapter 12, where you should be turned, <coughs> if you followed my instruction. Verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Notice how the appeal here is, 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 an, is just that. It's an appeal. I beseech you. Therefore, and it's an appeal to believers. This is not a verse for unbelievers about how to go to heaven. This is an appeal to believers who are going to heaven and who now, based upon the mercies of God, the grace of God, their position in Christ, their possessions in Christ, their privileges in Christ, are now being asked to present your bodies, to yield your bodies to the Lord, to present them, having been co-crucified, co-buried, co-risen, dead to sin, and alive to God, reckoning it to be true, presenting yourself to the Lord as a living sacrifice. You see, there are no sacrifices for sin anymore because Christ was the last. And now, in ex as an expression of gratitude, motivated not by the law of God, but the love of God, we now yield ourselves to the Lord as a living sacrifice, which is to be holy, set apart. In a sense, we're Nazarites. We're set apart unto God, holy. And now we're to yield our body so that it could be holy, set apart unto God, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And the word for reasonable is the word in which we get from the Greek logical. It's the logical conclusion in light of what Christ has done for you and who you now are in Christ to present your body as a living sacrifice. It's reasonable to the Lord. It's an act of worship to the Lord out of gratitude for what he's done. And with that kind of attitude, now he says, and be not conformed to this world. And that is a command. Stop letting the world dictate policy in your life. Stop going by the standards of the world. Stop letting the world squeeze you into its mold. Stop getting your cues and how you think and what you value and what you believe from the world. But in contrast, be transformed by the renewing of your mind in the word of God. And it does take a transformation. It doesn't happen all at once. And your mind needs to keep getting renewed and renewed and renewed that you may prove, you may put to the test, as it were, in your daily life what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God for you. You see, be not conformed to this world is an imperative against worldliness. But what is worldliness? Worldliness is a mental attitude by which you develop your standards and values from the world instead of from God's word. Before salvation, you had no alternative but worldliness. Whether it be legalism or license or mysticism or whatever, I mean, you were thinking like the world. Because you weren't wired for sound. You didn't know the Lord. You didn't have the capacity to truly grasp or apply the word of God. But after salvation, now you have an option. And it'll take an ongoing willingness to expose and renew your mind to the word of God over and over again in order to let the spirit of God ca calibrate your thinking. 
And I say that because believers are a lot more worldly than they could ever imagine. They're conformed to the world in the area of morality in our day. They're confused when it comes to marriage and parenting. So often, we talk about what's eternally significant, but we tend to be very materialistic. So often, pride gets in our way. So often, we're hedonistic and pleasure is the bottom line. Even when it comes to politics, we haven't let the Word of God shape our thinking in many of these areas. And we have an entitlement kind of thinking. We think people owe us something. Instead of realizing we are what we are by the grace of God. And so often, instead of not being conformed to the world, we just let the world just mold us and shape us. And then we pass that on to our kids. And we wonder why they world, they're worldly. And with worldliness comes self-oriented thinking and living. And you see, that was Samson's second problem. He focused on the wrong objectives that revolved around self. You see, if you remember last time, me was Samson's favorite word. Get her for me! Me, me, me. As self was on the throne of his life instead of the Lord. And the same can happen to you and me. Is it? What are you living for, self or Jesus Christ? What is the bottom line for you, self, for Jesus Christ? Where are the arrows of your life pointing? Toward yourself or toward Jesus Christ and others? For the cry of the carnal is always, what about me? Who's ministering to me? What am I going to get out of this? You see, it takes the Spirit of God to think like this. In hearing about the trials and afflictions that were awaiting Paul should he go to Jerusalem, he says, none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear to myself. And that's one of our problems. We love ourselves. We, we count our life dear to ourselves. He says, I don't count it dear to myself so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry I've received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. You know, you have a race to run, believer. Are you running it? Looking on to Jesus, the author and finish of our faith. Or are you sliding for home? Are you redeeming the time? Don't waste these years. Well, I'm retired. Well, what are you retired to? We know what you're retired from. Are you letting your life count? You see, a third problem that Samson had is that he not only focused on wrong objectives that revolved around self, but he rejected authority by doing what he felt like doing. Remember, he rejected the authority of his parents. He rejected the authority of God's word. And keep in mind that the only person in this universe that is not under some kind of authority is God the Father. And every divine institution God has set up has a chain of command to be recognized and responded to, whether it is in the home or in the church or in the nation, and those in positions of delegated authority over others are not to abuse their authority for selfish purposes, but to lead and care for those under their authority. And those under delegated authority are to submit to those authorities as unto the Lord within biblical parameters. But Samson rejected his parents' authority and demanded that they get him a wife from among the Philistines which was contrary to the law of God. It was an unequal yoke. But Samson didn't care. Just like some carnal Christians don't care what God says. Because they choose to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And you see, as we pointed out last time, that God wants there to be an equal yoke on all levels. Not only in body, but in soul, but in spirit. And that is why God wants believers to marry other believers who know Jesus Christ and who can therefore be yoked together with a, another believer. And by the way, that's the minimum. And I say that because some people, you know, they just go for the brass rail. Well, he's saved. 
Well, what does he believe? Well, I don't really know much. <laughs> you know, but he sure is good looking. <laughs> you know, uh, what's his doctrine? What's his desire? What's his direction in life? Well, we've never really talked about it, because all we talk about is ourselves, you know. <laughs> you know, what is this all about? I'll tell you, there's no greater joy than to find a believer as a mate who's walking with the Lord, growing in the Lord, wanting to serve the Lord just like you are, if that's true of you. And I say that because sometimes I laugh, I hear of believers, you know, they, they've got, you know, Mary, let's see, I've got a list. You know, and, you know, there's 48 things on there, including body size. Can't seem to find. Well, how many uh, spiritual things are on there? Well, <laughs> not too much. Are they saved? And then I say to them, I say, let me ask you a question. What if they have a list? Are you going to be on that list? Probably not. So. <laughs> in fact, if they have their heads screwed on straight, they won't even be interested in you. Because why would they want to lower themselves to your <laughs> carnality? And that is why it is always best to wait on the Lord and let him direct your path in all of these decisions. But that's not how Samson was thinking. And that's why, fourthly, he lost his Nazarite separation. By going into a vineyard and by then touching a dead animal and then not telling his parents. In fact, he made a mockery of his disobedience by posing a riddle to some of the Philistines who attended his wedding. And then when they couldn't figure it out and they threatened his wife, he caved in under her pressure and still lost. For at the wedding feast, he posed the riddle which the Philistines couldn't figure out. And due to the urgings and manipulations of his wife-to-be, Samson told her the answer to the riddle, not knowing the Philistines' threats to her life and to her family. So she then spilled the beans to the Philistines, who then gloated when they told Samson the answer, which he knew had to come from his wife-to-be. And in his anger, Samson kept his promises of giving them 30 changes of clothes, but he did so by killing 30 Philistines from another city to get them. And then departed back to home, only to return later to find out that his wife-to-be had been given by her father to Samson's best man at the wedding. See, he caved into pressure and lost. But that's not all. Turn with me now to Judges chapter 16. Some of you thought I, you turned there earlier, you thought I screwed up. Well, I could have, but not this time. Judges chapter 16. So for Samson's carnality catches up with him here. He begins to reap what he has sown. He, his sin finds him out. But then again, does it surprise us? He had the wrong kind of separation. He focused on the wrong objectives. He rejected authority. He lost his Nazarite separation. He caves in under pressure. <coughs> Does it surprise us that he's going to reap what he has sown? And now, number six, he became friends with the wrong crowd. He becomes friends with the wrong crowd. Chapter 16, verse 1. Now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went in to her. Now, once again, we see the emphasis on the word saw. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh. He was a slave to his passions, and in this case, it was a prostitute. It was a harlot, and he went in to her. Samson's problem with women resurfaces here. He doesn't know how to or is unwilling to allow the Lord to give him victory over his flesh in this area. 
By the way, do you see the depths that a carnal believer can sink to and still truly be saved? So what happens, verse 2? When the, when the Gazites were told Samson had come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying, in the morning, when it is daylight, we'll kill him. We're going to murder him. And by the way, news travels, especially bad news. So they plot Samson's death. Samson, what are you doing there? And yet God is gracious to him, for verse 3 tells us, And Samson lay low till midnight. Then he arose at midnight, took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two gateposts, pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders, and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. <coughs> you see, he departs from this prostitute's and, and somehow knowing this was going to happen, or at least coming to the gates and seeing them locked, he just picks them all up. Now there's some difference of opinion how far he brought them on the way to Hebron or all 38 miles. Samson was like a whale hunting a minnow, which makes the shame of his squandered resources even more painful. And you see, he keeps kind of getting away with it, doesn't he? But it catches up, verse 4. Afterward it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. He loved a woman. Now this is not agape love. At best it's human affection or eros love. Verse 5. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him and find out where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him that we may bind him to afflict him. Notice, they didn't want to kill him. They wanted to afflict him. And every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Now, according to my research, there were five major Philistine cities. So if each of them offered, him 1100, offered her 1,100 pieces of silver, that's 5,500 pieces of silver. That's quite a haul. And she's willing to accept the bride. She could be bought. You know, it kind of reminds me of the man who years ago propositioned a woman and he said, uh, will you sleep with me for $10,000? She kind of blushed and said, uh, well, yes. And then he said, would you sleep with me for $10? And she said, well, what kind of woman do you think I am? And he said, <laughs> That's already been established. We're just simply working on the price. You see, Delilah has been bought. And the fact is, when it comes to serving the Lord, there's a price to pay to serve the Lord. There's not a price to pay to be saved. But if you want to serve the Lord, you're going to pay a price. You're going to be rejected at times, misunderstood at times, criticized at times, persecuted at times. And sometimes it won't even be from unbelievers. Sometimes it'll be from believers. So what's your price? To compromise the Lord and the word of God. In some cases it can be fame or it could be money or maybe a bigger ministry, an easier life, maybe just a date or an unsaved or carnal mate. <coughs> Remember, it's required of a man that he be found faithful. You know, that's how God evaluates success. Have we been faithful to what he's called us to do, doing it in the way he's wanting us to do it? And remember, temptation comes our way in sometimes some very attractive packages. Delilah apparently was very beautiful. 
But I think of the fact how bad company corrupts good morals. And so what happens? He became friends with the wrong crowd. And he fooled around with temptation instead of fleeing it. You see, if you toy with temptation, it will eventually trap you. That's why we're told in the Bible to flee fornication. We're told in 2 Timothy 2.22, flee youthful lusts. And by the way, some relationships a believer may have may need to end now. Right then. Samson should have left that relationship. Just like Joseph fled Mrs. Potiphar's house. And by the way, someone could have said, Samson, if your wife, if you felt free to call your wife a heifer, which he did earlier, you are a donkey to not flee this situation immediately. And sometimes we can play the donkey, I'm using a nice word today, when we are arrogant and stubborn and we justify what we're doing. And that's what he's doing, verse 6. So Delilah said to Samson, please, and I'm sure she did this with honey dripping, please tell me where your great strength lies and with what you may be bound to afflict you. I mean, what kind of question is that? <laughs> Please tell me how I can tie you up. I mean, uh, duh. <laughs> and Samson said to her, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings not yet dried, then I shall become weak and be like other men. So the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings not yet dried, and she bound him with them. Now men were lying in wait. They didn't expose themselves. They were in the background, staying with her in the room. And she <coughs> said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he broke the bowstrings with a strand of yarn, as a strand of yarn breaks when it touches fire. So the secret of his strength was not known. And this was a was nothing for him. Verse 19, Then Delilah said to Samson, Look, you have mocked me and told me lies. Now please tell me what you may be bound with. So he said to her, Well, if they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Therefore Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And men were lying in wait, staying in the room, but he broke them off his arms like, like thread. Like a thread. <coughs> Samson, or Delilah said to Samson, Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me what you may be bound with. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head into the web of the loom, so she wove it tightly with the batten of the loom and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled out the batten and the web from the loom. Notice, he just keeps toying with this whole situation. He's just playing with temptation. But you know, eventually, it catches up with him. Eventually, you bite the hook. Eventually, you play with a python and <coughs> you get bit. Like Proverbs 7, 7, I beheld among the simple ones. I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding. You see, what was going on during all of this is he's fooling around with temptation instead of fleeing it. And instead of heeding God's word, number eight, he didn't take seriously the Lord in his word. 
He didn't take seriously the Lord and his word. And we read in verse 15, Then she said to him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You've mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. Oh, now she plays the love card. <laughs> you know, you say you love me. You don't tell me how I can tie you up. <laughs> That really makes a lot of sense. <laughs> and I say that because sometimes people use the quote love card to get sexual favors. You know, if you love me, you'll let me. When in reality, if you were loving me right now, you would do what's best for me as I'm to the Lord and not even ask. Verse 16, it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him, when I'm talking about his shirt, so that his soul was vexed to death. Now that is a verse and a half. She pestered him daily with her words. And I'll tell you guys, guys, they can do that. And they just keep pestering. Relentless. 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 And they press you. So that his soul was vexed. You know the word vexed means tormented. Unto death. Now sometimes women can do this by just being nags. You know, they just nag. You know, like I've said before, they're like, and me, and me, and me, and me. And after a while, it's like, <laughs> okay, we'll do it. No, that's really good. Nye, nye, nye. Yeah. And I'm not trying to just pick on women here. That's the context. That's why the Bible talks about it. better to be on a housetop in the corner of a roof than to live below with a contentious woman. And there's some guys who live in those house cars. Now guys have their issues too. We'll have a chance to pick on them at another time. Okay. But we see here, as strong as he thought he was, he wasn't strong internally. And the fact is, given the right situation, any of us are capable of anything in the catalog of sin and caving into the temptation that's before us. Because frankly, as difficult as Delilah was, it's Samson's who's the believer. You know, I expect unbelievers to live like unbelievers. The problem is when believers live like unbelievers, that's the problem. <coughs> that's why he's the donkey in this situation. So she's pressing him and nagging him and pressing him and nagging him. And finally, verse 17, that he told her all his heart. With some guys, that takes 10 minutes. And, and said to her, no razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I'm shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. So Samson now spills the beans. I'm sure he didn't plan to spill the beans. But what happens is you keep going down that worldly path, and a lot of times you end up in places you never thought you would ever be as a believer. And dear saints, Samson, as a carnal believer, is fulfilling 2 Peter 1.9. He's become nearsighted, living for the temporal, not the eternal. Living for self, not the Lord. Living after the flesh, not the spirit. Living based on human viewpoint, not the word of God. And he's about to fulfill the last part of 2 Peter 1.9, which says, he that lacks these things is nearsighted even unto blindness. So we read in verse 18, 
When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, because they apparently had left, saying, come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hand. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees, called for a man, and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Now seven is the number of completion. Not just seven, but completely, that's the idea. Then she began to torment him and his strength left him and she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Then the Philistines took him, put out his eyes, brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters and he became a grinder in the prison. <coughs> we see here problem number nine. He's, he lost sight of where his real strength was due to his self-confidence. You know, when he said, the strength is in my hair, that's a half-truth. While his head had not been shaven since his birth, that unshaven head was only the symbol of his strength. His real strength was the Holy Spirit of God. By the way, do we lose sight of our strength? Our strength's not in ourselves, friends. It's not in our gifts. It's not in our talents. It's not in our abilities. It's in the Lord. And indeed, the Lord can use our talents and gifts and abilities as we're yielded to him. But we're not sufficient of ourselves to think anything as being from ourselves. Our sufficiency comes from God. Our strength isn't in our church, though God uses local churches for many godly purposes. Our strength isn't even in prayer, but in who we are praying to. It's not just in reading the Bible, but in believing and applying the word of God as we rely on the Lord. And because he lost sight of where his real strength was, due to his self-confidence, he then... Number 10, with his head having been shaven, he then suffers the tragic consequences of his carnality. He is blinded, and he is made a grinder. A grinder in the prison. You know, sometimes I ask carnal believers, well, how are you doing? And they say, well, I'm doing really well. Because they're evaluating everything circumstantially. <laughs> A lot of times they're miserable, they're chasing the wind, they're doing their own thing. The Lord has really not the central part of their life. They fit them in when it's convenient. But they sometimes witness even though they're carnal and they think they must be spiritual, because I witness once in a while, you know, maybe even a lot. But you can witness in your flesh. You see, Samson compromised, and the results were tragic in his life. And there he is, as a grinder, in the prison, He's now physically blind, though he had become spiritually blind, living in bondage, as it were, now. And a grinder usually worked, or I'm sorry, this work was usually assigned to slaves, women, and donkeys, but not men. Someone has said, sin blinds you, then it binds you, and then it grinds you. Sin degrades you. And that is what's happened in his life. <coughs> you see, he's fulfilling the verse we're looking at. 
For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Now, how does all of this apply to you? First of all, regarding separation, we must understand the importance of being set apart as unto the Lord in order to be properly separated from the world. God's not looking for some legalistic separation. He's looking for a genuine separation. Since we've been separated positionally, He wants us to be separated practically. And as we yield to the Lord and stop being conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that can happen. And that's why we're warned in 1 John 2. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And this is not of the Father, it's of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust thereof. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Tell me, what kind of separation do you have? Are you different than the world? Or are you beating after the things of the world? Are you conformed to the world? Are you living for the world? Are you living for the Lord? Because you see, that's the second thing we learn from our story today. Regarding objectives, we must evaluate whether our goals are Christ-honoring or just self-focused. Can you say like Paul, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain? Can you ask the Lord to bless your endeavors because they are done for Jesus Christ and not self? What are your objectives in life? What are your bottom lines? Thirdly, we've learned regarding authority that we must learn to submit as unto the Lord to the authorities that God places over us and, not, and if we are an authority, to not abuse our delegated authority for selfish purposes instead of serving others. And by the way, the place to learn that is at home. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. You are not doing your kids a favor, parents, by not teaching them to obey you the first time when you command them what to do. We've also seen regarding marriage, we must not become unequally yoked together with an unbeliever in our choice of a marriage partner. It's one thing if we get saved after. And if we indeed blow it and you do marry an unbeliever, the Bible does have instructions for you how to make the most of that. But on this side of marriage, when you have a choice, don't get unequally yoked together. As a believer, find another believer, a believer that loves the Lord more than they love you. And you will be very happy if you do. <coughs> a fifth application we see from our stories regarding friends. We must be selective concerning our close friends as bad company corrupts good morals. But keep in mind, birds of a feather flock together. So ask yourself, what's drawing you to your friends? And by the way, are your friends encouraging you or are they corrupting you? <coughs> and by the way, in the reverse, are you encouraging your friends or are you corrupting them? We've seen in our story today regarding temptation, we must learn to resist and flee from it through the power of God's word and spirit or suffer the severe consequences of our carnality. We're to flee youthful lusts. We're to walk in the spirit so we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. We're to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and do not make provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. If you play with fire, you're going to get burned. But number seven, we've learned regarding failure. Or I should say we're about to learn regarding failure. That we must remember that no matter how seriously or consistently we have failed the Lord, He is still willing to forgive us and even use us <coughs> in the ways that He can. And I say that because there are some ways due to failure we may not be able to be used. But if we're still breathing air, God certainly still has a plan for our life. <clears throat> and so what happens to Samson? Verse 22. However, 
the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. And you know, as Samson's hair grew back, so did his relationship with the Lord. In fact, God's going to answer his prayer in this passage, which indicates he had been restored to fellowship with the Lord. Verse 23, Now the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to rejoice. You see, Dagon was their god. He was, it was a pagan idol. with the head of a man and the body of a fish. And the Philistines viewed military victories due to their gods and defeats as well. And so they're having this worship service, as it were, to their god. And what a better way to do it than put on display one of their great captures, namely Samson. Verse 23 goes on to say, and they said, our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. Well, they had a praise worship to Dagon. For they said, Our God has delivered into our hands our enemy, the destroyer of our land, and the one who multiplied our dead. And so they recognized, as it were, falsely that their God had given them victory. The fact is, their God was, was no God. It was God who was disciplining the children of Israel. That caused God to allow them to have this temporary victory. Verse 27, so it happened, when their hearts were merry, that they said, call for Samson, that he may perform or entertain for us. So they called for Samson from the prison and he performed for them. And I don't know what he did. He's blind. You know, he, he'd been grinding away, as it were. I don't know. Doesn't tell us what he did. But apparently he performed, he entertained for them. And then they stationed him between the pillars. Verse 26. Then Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, because he was blind, needed to be led around, let me feel the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. I can lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there, about 3,000 <laughs> men and women. 3,000 on the roof watching while Samson performed. Then Samson called to the Lord. He's looking vertically. His relationship has been restored. His fellowship has been restored. Saying, O oh Lord God, remember me. And when they say remember, it's not just give some thought about me. It's Come to my aid to do what only you can do. Remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O oh God, that I may, with one blow, take vengeance on the Philistines from my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple, and he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. Then Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on the lords and all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. One commentator says, and I quote, he died for the cause of his country and his God. He was not committing suicide, but rather bringing God's judgment on his enemies and willing to leave his own life or death to God. <clears throat> you see, according to the Abrahamic covenant, God had promised, I will curse them that curse Israel. I will bless them that bless Israel. The Philistines were cursing Israel, and therefore they get cursed. And on this occasion, the instrument God uses in order to cause the death of 3,000 Philistines is blind Samson. 
You know, as I thought of verse 30, I couldn't help but think of some carnal believers' funerals. How sometimes more unsaved people hear the gospel at their funeral than they did in the, the entirety of their life. And it doesn't need to be that way. God has a plan for our life, and he wants to use us by his grace to accomplish his objectives in our life, if we're willing to let him. But what we see here is though Samson had failed, God forgave him and even used him one last time. You see, this act of faith began the deliverance that God would provide for Israel from the Philistines. And that is why, regardless of how much you have failed, God is willing to forgive you. And God is even willing to use you if, if you are willing to let him. In fact, as I think of this, you know, God was so gracious with Samson that the Holy Spirit directed the writer of the book of Hebrews to include Samson, of all people, in the hall of fame of faith. You see, at the end of Hebrews 11, we read this, and what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and, and Barak and Samson. Samson? Samson. And Jephthah. Also David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong. There's Samson. He came valiant in battle. Turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Samson is mentioned in the Hall of Fame of Faith. You know why? Because he was a man of faith, though he wasn't a faithful man. And God was still willing, amidst his failures, to forgive him and even use him. And God isn't through with you yet either. Regardless of how much you may have failed or not failed in your Christian life, God isn't through with you yet either. You're still breathing air. You can still walk in fellowship with the Lord. You can still grow. You can still serve the Lord in what ways you can. There's still opportunities to glorify God and serve Jesus Christ as you walk by faith. Are you willing to turn to him? Are you willing to admit even your short-sightedness, even your blindness, and turn again to the Lord? For if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if you're here today and you don't know for sure you're saved, you can't forget that you were cleansed from your old sins if you've never been cleansed from your sins or forgiven. And the Bible tells us in Jesus Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Jesus Christ shed his blood to forgive you. He is willing to redeem you. He is willing to give you salvation. It's all by his grace. And Acts 10.43 tells us how we get a hold of it. To him, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him, shall receive remission of sins. And according to this verse, there's only one condition for the unbeliever for salvation, for forgiveness, to simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who shed his blood to redeem you and to forgive you and to give you eternal life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this vivid illustration in the life of Samson. May we take heed to it. May we not think we're beyond any of this. May we take to heart the principles we have heard, the applications that have been made, and say, Lord, is it I? Lord, show me what you want to show me, where I'm at in my thinking. May indeed, by virtue of your amazing mercy and grace, we present ourselves to you each and every day, as it were, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you, Lord, which is our reasonable service.
May we stop being conformed to this world. May we be transformed by the renewing of our mind in your word that we may truly live out what is that good and acceptable and perfect will you have for us. And thank you that when we fail to walk by faith, we can confess our sins and you do forgive us. But, and, you're not, and you are willing to work with us right where we're at and, and use us to whatever degree you're able to do so, just like you did with Samson. But oh, may we take heed to the tragic, severe consequences of carnality that can happen in our lives if we fail to walk by faith, if we fail to grow in grace, if we fail to become fruitful for you, for he that lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his old sins. May we not forget the price that was paid at Calvary and the victory that is available to us through the cross. In Jesus' name we pray.